St. Augustine called the Sunday after Easter Sunday the compendium of the days of mercy. Why would he say such a thing? The compendium of the days of mercy. Because in today's gospel, our Lord gives his priests the power to absolve from sin without limit. Many people today focus on the second half of the gospel reading for today's Mass. That is, Doubting Thomas. Which section ends with, You see and believe, but blessed are those who do not see and yet believe. There's a reason that's there. Because in the first half of the gospel, we're required to have faith to accept God's mercy. Let's look at the first half of the gospel then. Peace be to you. And he showed them his hands and his side. That is to say, by the power of the passion and death of Jesus, the trophies of which he still bears in his hands, his feet, and his side, peace is granted to mankind. And again our Lord says, Peace be to you. But the second time he adds, As the Father hath sent me, I also send you. See, the first time he showed the apostles the source of peace. It's the only source of true peace and the source of all grace. It's his passion and death. He showed them the marks in his hands and his side. Then he gives the reasons for peace. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. Now, even the heretics admit that the Father sent the Son for the purpose of restoring the friendship between God and man, the friendship that was lost in the Garden of Eden. So if the Son of God is sending the apostles with the same mission that he himself had from the Father, then the apostles must also have the mission of restoring man to friendship with God. Father Wolf is doing it right now, back there in that little room. Because in order to complete this mission of restoring sinners to friendship with God... Jesus Christ shared with his priests a power that belongs exclusively to God. He said, whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven them, and whose sins you shall retain, they are retained. First, he showed them the source of peace, his passion. Then he tells them the reason for peace, reconciliation with God, and then he gives them the means for peace, the power to forgive sins. Thus he said twice, peace be to you. And so who would not be peaceful knowing that God is your friend? Well, pretty much all of us, we all lack a certain peace. Because we're proud and we don't easily accept God's mercy. The fault is ours, not God's. If we're still too anxious and worried and fearful, the fault is ours. We have to pray constantly for humility. If we're afraid to go to confession, the problem is ours. God's mercy is there. He's waiting for us to accept it. And even though we are stubborn and the fault is entirely ours, God's love and mercy are without limit because God is love and God is mercy. He then continues to pursue us. And even in modern times, he revealed his sacred heart to St. Margaret Mary Alacoque. He sent his mother to St. Catherine Labouret 
into La Salette, into Lourdes, into Fatima. He himself came to St. Faustina. And he came also to Sister Josepha Menendez, whose account of her earthly love affair with divine love can be read in her own words and our Lord's words to her in a book that is now entitled The Way of Divine Love. His purpose, our Lord told Sister Josepha, was to, quote, disclose to the world the mercy and love of my heart. His purpose for his revelations to her, his purpose for his incarnation, passion, death, and resurrection. Jesus then, in a very definite and orderly plan, reveals his mercy and love to the world, among other things, through his words to Sister Josepha over the course of the last years of Josepha's life. She died in 1923 at 33 years old. So let's follow what it is our Lord revealed to Sister Josepha. In my heart, souls who know how to deny themselves will find true peace. I am an infinitely merciful Father. I shall be glorified by your objection, by your littleness, your nothingness. I do not love you for what you are, but what for, for what you are not. In your wretchedness and nothingness, I have found a place for my greatness and bounty. I wish to be loved in joy of heart. Love me ardently so as to correspond to my goodness to you. If you could but understand my joy when souls leave me free and by their deeds say, Lord, thou art the master. Do you realize how much this comforts me? One act of abandonment glorifies me more than many sacrifices. Think of me all the time. Souls glorify me so much when they remember me. Our Lord would later explain to Josepha that the intention, not the action, matters more to him than the action itself. That is, barring actions that are intrinsically evil. An action that is not evil in itself, but bathed in his blood, united to his actions, can be of more value than if a soul, quote, preached to the whole world. My love goes so far, he said, that souls can draw great treasure out of mere nothing. But he explains that those souls must belong to him, be united to him by their intention. His love can allow them to, quote, draw great treasure out of mere nothing, when as soon as they awake, they unite themselves to me and offer their whole day with a burning desire that my heart may use it for the profit of souls. My heart is an abyss of love. No wretchedness in you will turn the glance of my love from you. I am all love. My heart is an abyss of love. It was love that made man and all existing things that they might be at his service. It was love that moved the Father to give his Son for man's salvation, which through his own fault he had lost. It was love that caused a virgin who was little more than a child to renounce the charms of life in the temple and consent to being the mother of God, thereby accepting all the suffering involved in the divine maternity. It was love that caused me to be born in the inclemency of winter, poor and destitute of everything. It was love that hid me 30 years in complete obscurity and humble work. It was love that made me choose solitude and silence, to live unknown and voluntarily to submit to the commands of my mother and my adopted father. For love saw how in the course of ages many souls would follow my example and delight in conforming their lives to mine. It was love that made me embrace all the miseries of human nature, for the love of my heart saw far ahead. I knew how many imperiled souls would be helped by the acts and sacrifices of others, and so would recover life. 
It was love that made me suffer the most ignominious contempt and horrible tortures and shed all my blood and die on the cross to save mankind and redeem the whole human race. And love saw how in the future many souls would unite themselves to my torments and die their sufferings and actions, even the most ordinary, with my blood in order to win many souls to me. I will teach you all this very clearly, Josepha, that men may know how far-reaching is the love of my heart for them. My heart is all love, and it embraces all souls, but how can I make my chosen souls understand my special love for them, and how can I wish to use them to save sinners and so many souls who are exposed to the perils of the world? For this reason, I would like them to know how much I desire their perfection and that it consists in doing their ordinary actions in intimate union with me. If they once grasp this, they could divinize their lives and all their activities by this close union with my heart and how great is the value of a divinized day. When a soul is burnt up with desire to love, nothing else is a burden. If she feels cold and spiritless, everything becomes hard and difficult. Let her then come to my heart to receive her courage. Let her offer me her dejection and unite it to my fervor. Then she may rest content, for her day will be of incomparable value to souls. All human miseries are known to my heart, and my compassion for them is great. It is neither difficult nor hard to love my heart. It is sweet and easy. Purity of intention, be the action great or small, intimate union with my heart, and love will do the rest. My heart is not only an abyss of love, it is also an abyss of mercy. You must not give in to sadness. My love takes care of you. Jesus goes on to explain that generosity is the key to success. Because generosity is the sign of true trust in God, of real confidence. We have to give ourselves even when everything seems pointless, as long as we're giving to God. The soul that gives up is one that relies too much on itself. The impossible becomes possible only by total and confident giving to and trusting in God, not doing our own will but His. And absolutely everything is a gift from God. Many people challenge that statement, but there is nothing more true. If He is omnipotent and if He is all-loving, and he is, then absolutely everything is a gift from God. And he implies as much in this statement to Sister Josepha. Speaking of contradictions and sufferings, he says, When they come, look up generously and with love, as if I myself were speaking to you, and smile. When contradiction and sufferings come, Look up generously and smile. Those whose generosity is not equal to these daily endeavors and sacrifices will see their lives go by only of promise, which never comes to fruition. But in this, distinguish. To souls who habitually promise and yet do no violence to themselves, nor prove their abnegation and love in any way, I say, beware, lest all this straw and stubble which you have gathered into your barns take fire or be scattered in an instant by the wind. But there are others, and it is of them that I now speak, who begin their day with a very good will and desire to prove their love. They pledge themselves to self-denial or generosity in this or in that circumstance. But when the time comes, they are prevented by self-love, temperament, health, 
or I know not what else, from carrying out what a few hours before they quite sincerely proposed to do. Nevertheless, they speedily acknowledge their weakness and, filled with shame, beg for pardon, humble themselves, and renew their promise. Ah, let them know that these souls please me as much as if they had nothing with which to reproach themselves. Sorrow at our failings is just pride. True humility simply gives back to God even our failings. And that pleases him very much. Not the failure, but the love and the confidence that accepts his mercy and forgiveness for our failings. The love and the confidence that overcomes our own self-love and does not beat ourselves up or even be sorrowful at our failing, but thanks him because everything is a gift from God. And what do we mean by failure? Yes, even mortal sin. When speaking to Sister Josepha about his sacrifice on Calvary, our Lord said of Judas at the Last Supper, that by having all the apostles together, Jesus wished to show that, quote, it was my intention also to show souls that I never refuse grace even to those who are guilty of grave sin, nor do I separate them from the good whom I love with predilection. I keep them all in my heart, that all may receive the help required by their state of soul. But how great was my sorrow to see in the person of my unhappy disciple Judas the throng of those who, though often gathered at my feet and washed with my blood, would yet hasten to their eternal perdition. I would have these to understand that it is not the fact of being in sin that ought to keep them from me. They must never think that there is no remedy for them, nor that they have forfeited forever the love that once was theirs. No, poor souls. The God who has shed all his blood for you has no such feelings for you. Come, all of you, to me, and fear not, for I love you all. I will wash you in my blood, and you shall be made whiter than snow. All your offenses, all your offenses will be submerged in the waters in which I myself shall wash you. Nor shall anything whatsoever be able to tear from my heart its love for you. Josepha, let your soul be seized today with an ardent desire to see all souls, especially sinners, come and purify themselves in the waters of repentance. Let them give themselves up to thoughts of confidence, not fear. For I am a God of pity, ever ready to receive them into my heart. Confidence, not fear. But confidence, we saw, takes humility. The more clearly we recognize our littleness and nothingness, the greater will be our confidence and trust and finally love. Fear is the mark of a small soul, a soul who has much to learn and a lot of growing to do, and we all suffer from it. But our Lord never refuses grace, even to those in mortal sin, if they will only turn to him with contrition and confidence. As proof of what he says, that he never refuses grace to souls, even souls in mortal sin, our Lord went on at length to speak of his love in the Blessed Sacrament, where he waits for sinners day and night. But he makes known, too, his sorrow that not even his chosen souls love as they ought to love, but oftentimes receive communion out of habit or thoughtlessness and spend no time talking with him in the sacrament of the altar, in the supreme sacrament of love, talking with him about their thoughts, their fears, their worries, their temptations. Everything that concerns us concerns him. 
and he wants to know. St. Augustine says that we tell God our needs, not so much that God may know our needs, but that we may know our need for God. It's humility and confidence that pleases him most. And what of unworthy souls? Souls who have declared war on God. They prefer hatred rather than anger. He does not refuse his grace even to them. And he speaks to them. O oh, all you who are steeped in sin, and who for a time more or less, more or less long, have lived as wanderers and fugitives because of your crimes, if the offenses of which you have been guilty have hardened and blinded your hearts, if to grant satisfaction to one or another of your passions you have sunk into evil ways, ah, when the motives or accomplices of your sin have forsaken you, and you realize the state of your soul, then do not yield to despair. For as long as breath of life remains, a man may have recourse to mercy and ask for pardon. If you are still young, if already the scandal of your life have lowered you in the eyes of the world, do not be afraid. Even if there is reason to treat you as a criminal, to insult and cast you off, your God has no wish to see you fall into the flames of hell. On the contrary, he ardently desires you to come to speak. Come see him so that he may forgive you. If you dare not speak to him, at least look at him and let the size of your heart reach him. And at once you will find his kind and fatherly hand stretched out to lead you to the springs of pardon and life. Should it happen that you have spent the greater part of your life in impiety and indifference, and that the sudden approach of the hour of death fills you with blinding despair, do not let yourself be deceived. For there is still time for pardon. If only one second of life remains to you in that one second, you can buy back eternal life. If your whole life has been spent in ignorance and error, if you have been a great cause of scandal and evil to other men, to society at large, or even to religion, and if through some set of circumstances you have come to realize that you have been deceived, do not allow yourself to be crushed by the weight of your sins and the evil of which you have been in the of which you have been the instrument. But with a soul penetrated with deep contrition, throw yourself into the abyss of confidence and hasten to him who awaits your return only to pardon you. The case is the same for a soul that has been faithful to the observance of my law from childhood, but who has gradually cooled off into the tepid and unspiritual ways of an easy life. She, ha she has, so to say, forgotten her soul and the higher aspirations. God was asking of her great efforts, but blinded by habitual failings, she has fallen into tepidity worse than actual sin. For her deaf and drowsy conscience feels neither remorse nor hears the voice of God. Then, perhaps that soul awakens, and with a shock of realization, life appears to have been a failure, empty and useless for her salvation. She is lost in numerable graces, and the evil one, loath to lose her, makes the most of her distress, plunges her into discouragement, sadness, and dejection and finally casts her into fear and despair. O souls whom I love, pay no heed to this ruthless enemy, but as soon as possible have recourse to me, and filled with deepest contrition implore my mercy, and have no fear. I will forgive you. Take up again your life of fervor, and you will have back your lost merits. And my grace will never fail you. But while our Lord will never fail us, he knows well that we will only too often fail him. And so he wants to make clear for us the consequences awaiting those who finally refuse his grace, that grace which he is always offering to all souls, even hardened sinners, 
even those in the state of mortal sin, if only they will return with confidence and contrition. Souls that will not accept God's mercy, however, for any reason whatsoever, are of course condemned by their own choice to that place where every bodily pain imaginable is poured out on them to an unimaginable degree, especially those pains which correspond to their particular sins of self-love, be they greed or sloth or lusts or gluttony or any of the rest. Those passions and appetites and faculties are particularly tortured which were used by that person in life to particularly offend our Lord. Josepha more than once was taken to hell and suffered herself or witnessed all of these things. But because the greatest offense against God is to not accept his mercy and love, the greatest offense against God is to not accept his mercy, then the greatest torment for the damned will necessarily be what they all have in common, the inability to love. This is my torture, cried one soul, that I want to love and cannot. There is nothing left to me but hatred and despair If one of us could so much as make a single act of love, this would no longer be hell. But we cannot. And another damned soul. Oh, how we hunger for love. We are consumed with the desire of it. But it is too late. But it is not too late for us. As long as there is life... It is not too late. If even one breath remains to us, there is hope for mercy, hope to buy back eternal life. No matter what our sins, faults, failings, weaknesses, no matter what our life has been, in malice or in ignorance, even given over to Satan himself, Jesus Christ will refuse us nothing if we approach him humbly, generously, with contrition, with confidence, not fear. Hasten to him who awaits your return only to pardon you. Pay no heed to the ruthless enemy. He who has poured out his life for you will not let that life be wasted 